Thank you very much. So it is my real pleasure to be here today and to talk to you and talk to you about the future of humanity, the future of robotics, and the future of how these two things can live in symbiosis together. So a few things on how, what inspired me as a child. So when I looked into the world, and I grew up in Switzerland, and I saw all these watches around. There are so many watches in Switzerland. And what I liked about them the most is to take them apart and distribute them all over the apartment, uh, which my mother obviously wasn't very happy about. And also I used to like to um, play with explosives, so to build them myself and you know, do experiments in front of the window. So once I blew up the window by accident, and so my mother, again, wasn't very happy, but then I went on, studied mechanical engineering, and ended up at Harvard doing research with explosives and similar mechanisms like the watches. So there, um, the research was featured on, a, on RSS, which is a major robotics conference, and got an award there as well. So then, the happy ending, my mother was really happy about that, so at the end. Now, thinking of that, what really combines it is the technology, the humans, and also how we can take inspiration from nature. So what we can learn from natural systems, from bios, uh, biological systems or ecosystems to improve this type of robots. Now, if you look at uh, the world today, we see that there are over 500,000 UAVs or drones or flying robots, or just different names for the same thing, per year that are being built. And so they range from military, where often it started from, but it goes also into agriculture, media, industry, consumer markets. And I suppose many of you here actually have bought some for your kids, I guess, on last Christmas. So they've become really, really very popular and become a part of our lives already now. Now, some of the applications, just to mention them, for example, is EasyJet. It uses them to scan the wings of the airplanes at Gatwick Airport to inspect them before flights. It's much cheaper, much faster than doing it manually much more reliable as well, because you can use laser scanners, and you can create these 3D maps of those surfaces. So it's a very convenient way how to quickly inspect large or small structures in that, in that example. So then there are other examples in oil and gas industry. BP, for example, also is exploring the use of drone technology to inspect pipelines, fly across fields. And there are other, exper uh, other projects which look at the larger scale of using fixed-wing airplanes to map entire landscapes. So these systems you can buy today. So this is solved. So far it's on the market, and you can launch them. They fly, have cameras, and because of the camera, and because of the sensors on board of the drone, they can map the environment and create a 3D map very conveniently, which can then be used to uh, plan how to build a road, how to build a pipeline, and can be very useful information for many applications. Now, the question is, where do we go in the next 20 years? So, what, so we see the potential of this technology, but where will it go? What's the next step? What's the emerging technology, the emerging trends in that? And to do that, let me take a step back, and we look at our beautiful planet. And we see that it is very rich. It's all the animals, the ecosystems. And if you zoom in of how the planet works, so how nature works, we see that there are clouds, there are oceans, and the general way how things are organized on this planet is that they're working as ecosystems. So they're working as multi-agent systems that work together, that cohabit, and also cohabit the build environment. So there's the architecture, there is the agents, there are the fluid dynamics. There are all these things that come together that make our world as it is. And this really is one of the principles of how nature builds. So if we then go step out again, we see that humans came into the picture not very long ago and inhabited this beautiful planet with all these cities. And in fact, what happens is that most of our human, or most of the human population will live in future cities. So in the next 20 years, three out of four people will live in a city. So that's a huge development. It's a huge trend of urbanization, urbanization which really calls for new technologies and new ways how to live together, how to cohabit and how to enable our ways, how to be more healthy and more happy. So what we see then in parallel is that there is an increasing um, need for connectiveness, so for connectedness, 
And this ecosystem will really be part of our cities in the future. So if we then look in our cities, how they look today, the question is how can we make a technology, invent our ways how we use technology to be centered around our well-being, around our ways of how to live a healthy life. And so there are many aspects to that. What I want to outline today to, and talk to you about is how material flows are important in that, information flows, and how the built environment can be enabled by, in particular, mobile flying robots. So my talk is about flying robots, but it is about focus areas on material flow, information flow, and architecture. Okay, good. So if you think um, about materials, there are a lot of things that come together. It's about logistics, it's about utilities, it's about cargo, transport. You see pictures like that. And usually, um, these stripes here, right, are not stripes, but more like static pictures, right, of cars waiting in traffic jams. So the cargo and um, logistics usually in big cities is very much limited. So the bottleneck is the way how things are transported, how the materials flow. And so if you then think of the social need, for example, in London, we see that there's a huge need of transporting large amounts of material inside of the, uh, inside of the city. And there's a study of um, Amazon, for example, that says that 86% of all the things that Amazon delivers is two kilograms or less. So it's really small items that get delivered. So it's an iPad, it's small you know, things that get delivered and need to be delivered very quickly, very efficiently, and at a low CO2 cost. Now then using um, drones to do that, if you imagine that, the advantages is that it is a scalable approach. So instead of having one truck that carries a lot of these small items and goes from station to station and like this visits all places by carrying all the packages, we could have a distributed, flexible logistics system that would be much faster, much cheaper, and have much lower risk. Also, if you think of the traffic accidents that are, that are produced by uh, logistics as a lar in large, this could really be greatly improved by having mobile autonomous systems. Now, Amazon is a very um, famous example, and the video that they released looks something like that, so it's called Amazon Prime Air. And so you have a package, gets put on a drone, UAV, a quadrotor platform, and then would fly and deliver the packages based on GPS navigation and so on. But the problem here is that this type of platforms are really not ready. So we're really not there yet. So it works very well as an idea, but the technology is not fully developed yet. So these drones are not safe. So if they crash into someone, they're really dangerous. They cannot carry much weight. They can carry a few hundred grams, a few kilograms maybe. They can fly maybe 15, 30 minutes, so not much longer. And also, they are not uh, robust. They cannot fly through complex environments. So also, I think uh, that central London might not be the first place to start. So if you have a drone deliver network, so I think, one of, first of all, London is a very challenging environment. But at the same time, getting your iPod a little bit faster or not is not that life saving, right? There's other areas where this is much more important. And one project that I'm involved in is to have uh, blood delivery networks between rural hospitals in Africa. So we have a testing site in Rwanda where we, um, by 2017, we aim at demonstrating these delivery networks for medical supplies, which there really makes a huge difference for many lives of uh, people that just don't have enough blood on site. And also what you see here is that the road infrastructure might not be developed. So now the question is, where do we invest? Do we invest in developing the road infrastructure? Or do we invest in developing directly the aerial logistic systems? So instead of making telephone lines, we could invest. Africa actually largely invested in wireless networks. So the same thing can happen with aerial delivery on top of the existing infrastructure on ground. Now then, on a more... Um, kind of business um, note. What I think is important, where it touches to, is the supply chain pressures. So it's really about the logistics. And it's not only about being able to move the material. It's also about knowing how to move it, knowing the information that are important for it to be moved effectively. So it's really the intelligence in 
symbiosis with the logistics and with the different uh, aspects on quality and reliability that really makes the business grow and thrive and at the end leads to the customer satisfaction with these processes. Now if you then think about uh, information flow, so which kind of information do we want? And one, of course, is the traffic, so we want to know where is traffic so we can plan our routes. But we also want to know other things, such as if you look at a city, we can think of the energy losses. We can look at turbo maps, how energy is lost in cities, and we can optimize that. Or we can use them as an emergency response tool to better guide emergency response teams to actually go there where help is needed instead of first going to explore. And so what is happening at the moment is that we have data, right? We have some usually very sparse sensors that are on buildings or in different places. They provide us with some data, and based on that, we have some models that predict the future of what will happen. So for example, the weather, right? is very much on, based on a few data points and then gets expanded with complex, um, very relatively uh, little reliable, re reliability to predict what is happening. Now, this of course is limited because we don't have very good data and it doesn't work really well to predict the future. Now instead of that, what we could have is a now casting approach. So instead of having the prediction, we would have data systems, so data collection nodes that would be able to fly and perch to uh, telegraph poles or to the cities and really from there collect the information that we need to be able to much more precisely predict the, predict the data, but also verify the models in real time. So this would greatly improve a lot of different applications. So for example, if you would have a, a cityscape and there's a demonstration or something happens which creates a traffic jam, you can imagine having this type of perching vehicles that would attach to surfaces, look at the traffic jam and then allow other ones to monitor the, traf uh, the air quality and redirect the traffic in real time. Now, another aspect to mention and to build on that is that these robots, if you imagine that they would be sitting there, would not just be sitting there passively, but they could be curious. So they could be thinking of, well, what is happening over there? So there is some heat source or some smoke. So how can we, what is happening there? So they will go themselves using swarm curiosity to actually fly there and detect what is happening to see and how to react the best. Now they will come and then go and then together actually explore this autonomously and then provide the feedback to the people. So I'm very happy also that we have Alessio before in the, in the room and people that actually are very curious about how to make this uh, information guaranteed. So is it actually a fire? What is it? So we really need also guarantees and uh, reliability in the data and in the behavior of these vehicles. Okay, so if you then think of um, the built environment. So what if we could use uh, flying vehicles to enable the built environment? Or the question is, how can we improve the build, build, equipment, uh, build environment with flying vehicles? And this also is, again, something that happens already now. And this is the, I'm sure you recognize, the Battersea Power Station. And the company that refurbishes, develops this uh, new development, already is using drones to inspect the different structures. So they use drones, fly close to the structure, take a picture, and this informs the repair tasks and reinforms very quickly of what is needed to be done on the facilities. Now the next step then would be to not just inspect it, so not just take a picture, but to repair it. So to use the vehicle to fly there and repair in situ in real time and very quickly without having to build the scaffolding around, which takes time and is expensive. And the step after that would then be to not just repair, but build and construct the buildings with flying vehicles. So you can imagine swarms of flying vehicles that will come, fly, and build the build environment. Now, of course, uh, this thought, you might have maybe written that on the it will not happen cards, right? <laughs> but there is a trend in construction that happens which is very similar to that. And in, base, in fact, it's based on ground-based uh, 3D printers that are building the building, building the houses. And this is a company, Winston in China, which has built um, 10 of those houses in 24 hours, each costing only 5,000 US dollars. So it's a completely different approach to construction, very much um, 
allowing design freedoms, allowing a, a, a speed of construction which is unmatched so far. So really, it's a step change in how things are built. So if you then imagine that we would have flying vehicles that would come and build architectural structures, now this would not only allow the, to build where we could not build at the moment, so at high sites or in areas that are hard to access, but it would also um, allow for new ge geometries, new architectural expressiveness, and new ways how to build and how to construct our built environment. So it would be really very much a step-changing approach. Um, <coughs> now, thinking of building new structures, it's really you know, something where we invent the future, so we reinvent ourselves as a society. But as a society, we also have a memory, right? We think back, and our identity is very much connected to the heritage. It's very much connected to our buildings and to our history. And one problem in the UK, but in many countries, is that all these heritage buildings are very much in danger. So there are cracks, there are leaks, there are um, really a lot of challenges. And building a scaffolding around these 50,000 units that are in the UK is very difficult because it's very expensive. So there again, we could use flying vehicles to repair or monitor these structures to help preserve our history and invent our next step in our future. OK, so but if you think then of how we can do that, and to motivate that or to show you something of where we are today, um, I've bring the law, brought along one of our toys or one of our platforms, which are the current technologies, something that you can buy today. So it's, my, it's on a dog leash, right? It's my pet. So it hopefully works, does it? So, so it's alive. That's still OK. That's very good. So that's a quadrotor platform, so it can fly. And it uses onboard sensors to be very stable. So it's a, well, I <laughs> tried to keep it. OK, so, so just to see a little bit how it flies, right? So it's actually relatively stable. It can hover for about 15 minutes. And it's very much my friend, right? So it comes here. But the problem is it's not my friend if I would touch it too closely. <laughs> so there's some dangers about it, and the sensors are really limited, as I mentioned before. So there are a lot of limitations of that. So this can be bought today, but this cannot do all these things that I mentioned. So it's really the today technology is not good enough. The question is, how can we build on that? How we can we improve that? And so as a step forward to that, um, we describe the paradigm how to build this environment. And so I call this the bio-inspired uh, robotics paradigm, where we look on nature, we extract, abstract the principles, and then implement this in the build environment. Now with this, so I think um, it's getting 12 o'clock, so I hand over to Chris. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for interrupting your talk like that. And it, it came at a very logical time. And we, we're going into that gear shift, if you like, to look at the bio-inspiration. So, um, so that is good timing. It is just coming up to 12 o'clock. So it's uh, an opportunity for us all to observe the uh, well, Europe-wide and certainly nationwide uh, minute silence to remember those who were um, uh, killed and injured in the Tunisia attacks. So, so we'll just uh, take a seat and uh, we'll carry on in about a minute. Okay, everybody. Well, that's the minute over and uh, so when we took that break we'd had that brilliant demonstration of the uh, of the drone I, is there any chance that we could see that again can it be powered back up again and uh, as, as Moko was, was doing that, he'd obviously been beginning to talk about new um, architectural forms, a real kind of wake-up moment for me, the idea that we'll have buildings that we could never have dreamt of through um, unmanned aerial vehicles, putting these buildings together. And then, of course, he began to pose the problem that he has this great machine that he's going to demonstrate for us again, and that's all very well, but, but where next? It's, it's a wonderful piece of technology, but in terms of complexity, it still needs to go to the next level and that's, I assume, where he's going to take us into this whole discussion of bio-inspired design. So thanks so much for picking back up for us. And uh, if you can give us another flying lesson, that'd be amazing. Thank you. OK, so I mean, you see it's remote control, this one. It can fly by itself, 
using GPS waypoint navigation. But the regulation is really not there yet as well to allow it to do that. So the technology to do that is actually there. So it's pretty much solved. But doing it, doing it in the UK is very hard. So we have here sometimes, that's another way how to control them is to have markers and have external cameras that track it very, preci very precisely in flight. And this is what you'll see in some of the slides that follow. OK, so now one of the big challenges is how to have the battery on board that would sustain all the flights that needs to happen. That's really one of the big challenges. Now, there are different approaches to that. And one of them is to use better batteries. The other one is to fly and attach to surfaces and not use the battery. That's really <laughs> maybe a much more effective way of saving the battery if you just don't use it. And the, so using this perching mechanism that we developed, we can have a small vehicles that would attach the surfaces and sense the environment from flight, like birds that would be able to perch to the environment. So the way how this works is that you have a small mechanical trigger which releases two pins that attach to the surface. It's similar to your hand. So when you have your hand, if you press in the middle of your hand, the hand closes by itself. So it's really the mechanical response of the hand. It's not a neurological response that it closes by itself. It's really the smartness of the mechanical design. And this is something that we implemented here as well, of using these mechanical smart grippers to allow it to perch to buildings, to walls, and then would able, be able to detach and fly again. Now, as another example, if you think of um, spiders, and so they're not very popular usually. Many people don't like them very much. But what they are very good at is building structures in unpredefined environments. So what they do, actually, is they build very geometrically precise structures in completely unknown environment using onboard sensors, onboard control, onboard materials that they extrude for doing that. And like this, even sit in the middle and use it as a sensor. So they use the web as a sensor to hear what's happening in the environment. So it's a completely incredible way how to use structures, how to build in the environment. So in part from that, we looked at ways how we can use uh, spider web type approaches to um, build scaffolds that allows us to perch to the environment. So for example, if we would have an oil, oil rig, let me see this. OK, it doesn't work. Um, but you can imagine that we would have the oil rig with an area that is hard to access on the top. And we would have robots that would build a support scaffold. And another one would perch to it and lower itself down on the string to inspect slowly the structure that it sees. So this would allow it not only to save huge amounts of energy because it can stay for hours with the same battery, but also it could um, be very close to structures that it cannot access otherwise. So the video, unfortunately, doesn't work. We showed it in, with the flying vehicles, so swarms, buildings, spider webs. So, but I'm happy to show you at the stand uh, over lunch or afterwards if you want to see more details. Um, so the other one, then, the yeah, next step would be to not only inspect, but also repair to build or to 3D print the environment. And for that, we looked into nature again. And we see um, one example being birds that build their own nests. So, and here what you see is the uh, editable nest swiftlets. Do you know bird nest soup, right? Have you tried, maybe? OK, so it's the saliva of these birds, right? <laughs> and what they do is they print those nests using the saliva as an adhesive and structural element to then 3D print their nest. So basically, they invented 3D printing. OK. So then similarly, we built a flying vehicle that can fly and 3D print from flight by extrusing um, polyurethane foam, so two-component foam, which then would expand. And like this, they build up layers to build, uh, build up the environment. And so you see here, that's about the precision that we get so far. Although this platform is the most precise that you can buy. And the 3D tracking environment is the best one can buy as well. On top of that, we developed the best nonlinear force compensated flight controllers. And you see, it's still difficult to be very precise. And this is really because of the aerodynamics that happens close to ground. It's really hard to fly very precisely. So we're now developing different ways how to actually have millimeter precision and be able to really build up different layers to 3D print different structures. OK, so the other aspect would be also to not just build the environment, but to sample the environment. 
and not only sample the air for air quality as it's possible now, but to sample also the water, so the water health. So water being the next uh, gold, they say, right? So water is really a very important resource and we want to ensure water health. Now for that, if you look at these uh, pelicans, in fact, what they do is they fly and they dive into the water and then are able to fly back out of the water to return to the base station where they want to go. So similarly, we are building these um, vehicles, we call them aquamaps, that would fly from a rescue vessel here in a toxic spill scenario, for example. They would fly off, dive into the water to close their wings, dive underwater, and then fly back out uh, to, to move in air. Now, doing that, of course, is very challenging. There's about, you have to develop uh, wing folding mechanisms. It's about aerodynamics, fluid dynamics. It's about the interface. It's about control. It's about propulsion. So all these things need to come together and need to be co-developed because they depend on each other. So the fluid dynamics is everywhere. The propulsion depends on it as well. So that's one large project that we have. And this is the first prototype that we have built where we have a small CO2 uh, charge canister. So it's a small aqua mouth, so we call it aquatic <laughs> micro vehicles, which has small um, compressed gas chamber here on the top and ejects the water to jump out of the water and can jump up to 100 times its size out of the water. So you see it will accelerate and just jump out of the water to then retake flight and come back. So here again, very happy to show you the video later also, some of the prototypes that we have. Now this being a very difficult problem, but it's something that we overcame by looking at the systems design, so that we're co-developing the different aspects of the vehicle. So then the challenges are really one, of course, regulation, where we want to not hinder innovation, but support our development and become a competitive environment and country where this type of development can happen. But also it's about multidisciplinary design, systems design, which I mentioned. So it's really about materials and aerodynamics and structures and combustion and biology working together. So science tends to be somewhat fragmented in very deep pockets of different technologies and approaches. So we really need to combine this closer to enable this type of robotic system. And also we need creative solutions. We need to enable the students or our researchers to be creative, to have the courage to be different, to take a step which is not common, where people might think, well, you're actually a bit, <laughs> think about it again. But actually this step of having these great, bold ideas and then failing on them and then reiterating, this actually makes all the difference. So we need to be courageous and supportive and open-minded to different new ideas. So this will make the difference. And most of all, what we need also is the support from the society. So what is happening in the drone world is that there is a lot of debate on aerial vehicles that would do assassinations in countries and so on. Of course, it's a very de important debate. But the public perception is changing now. So it's not only charged from the negative so much. It's more now going into the perception that drones can be used for humanitarian purposes. So I call them drones for humanity. So it's really, they can be used and penetrate all of our lives and help us to live more healthy and in a more productive way together. The other number which helps in the entire development or which is basically the result of this acceptance is that the market of UAV startups is growing by more than 100% per year. So it's really one of the fastest growing areas in technology. So really this by itself is one reason why the, the, these opportunities are important. And generally to recap is that they're important in areas where the workforce is at risk, so in areas that are dangerous, hard to access, toxic, nuclear, or um, just not very pleasant to work in for many years for many people. And also areas where people need help, where they need intelligence, where, when they, where they need guidance from aerial vehicles or uh, different systems to um, guide the rescue teams to go in places where they should go. And last but not least, also to monitor the environment and to allow us to have a more sustainable way how to live together, to help us study climate change and protect our environments and our ecosystems so that we will then live together with the robots and they would help us to uh, have a better life. So <clears throat> to close again and take one step more out, I think we're very much, we will be very much, and we are already now starting to be on a robotic planet where this technology becomes part of our lives. Now our lives 
are still human. So it's really about the humans and the ecosystem of how we can use technology to enable and improve that, our lives. And like this, that's also a call for all of us because we invent the future. So we invent of how to make this combination, we'll make it a smart planet where we all live in harmony with the machines, but also with each other. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.